to one o'clock, and I want you to hear my mother. So, uh, but just real quickly, this is the woman that my mother testified against. Uh, she was living in the United States, and one of the survivors spotted her. And my mother testified against her, and she was sent back to Germany, put in prison. And um, now I'm going to turn it over to my mother, and thank you so very, very much. I'm sure you can hear me. Yes? Because I'm much shorter than my, my daughter, <laughs> which I really have to applaud her and thank her very much. Yes, um, she's doing really a very good job. And, uh, <laughs> and I really would like to mention she was always so, I couldn't talk about all of those things because she was very sensitive and I used to be very careful that she is not, you know, um, listening. But then I'm really turned out very strong and I'm very, really proud of her. Anyway, I would like to mention also, it's important for you to notice that on the map, our city, it was very rare in Poland, had two names, Mienzyrzec, is on the map, you probably noticed and wondered. And then we had the Yiddish name, Mezrij, which was very, very, you know, known for, especially from the yeshiva. We had a very famous, you know, very uh, rabbi, higher than a rabbi, as you know, the Mezrij are gone. And I still remember when I was little, when he died, we had people from all over the world coming. So, um, Anyway, first of all, also, I would like to tell you that uh, from 18,000 Jewish population in our hometown, there are only 200 survived from the concentration camps. We have maybe another 100, 150 who su survived in hiding or in Russia. So it gives you an idea. This was a very industrial city, known all over the world. Our brochures were even coming to the United States. So this is the reason that our ghetto was kept, our, you know, longer. We had, in, uh, uh, they were bringing in from other towns, bigger towns, to the, before they made it Judenrein, Judenrein's no more Jews, as you know, bringing into our city, and it was a really horrible, we went through seven, seven transport, from transports, the, you know, in our city until it was Unirain. I was on the sixth one before already the last one. I really try to abbreviate everything because we don't have too much time. And um, it was really a long time when I came out of that hell that I could not talk about it. I could not even smile. Whenever something was funny, I could freeze and always felt, you know, for those who couldn't make it and what was my reason for my making it. And um, until one day, when I start hearing the voices of the skinheads denying it did not happen, even, to, even now in these days, I want you to know, you hear voices, it's a lie, it did not happen. Then it came into me like a, a storm, like, like something, you know, a strength, and the answer of my purpose of my surviving, that I have to speak about it. And especially 
When Regina already mentioned to you, because I, have to, I don't have too much time to, to speak about it, but this I'll take out the most important, you know, to fill in the horrors, what I have seen and I went through. And when we finally arrived, you know, you can imagine that our, yeah, like she mentioned, our transport was going to, my, uh, to Tremblinka. And Tremblinka, they had so many still trains standing, they couldn't kill the people fast enough. So our train, we could see back and forth, we didn't understand at the moment what is happening. And they railed us to Majdanek. In Majdanek, it was only one guest chamber. And um, it was a horrible camp. And especially, I want to, I think I was uh, uh, doing or giving to you the pictures of the uh, SS women, and especially of the one which you noticed here, I was testifying against her. She was really, it's really unbelievable, as a woman, what, what a sadist she was. When you saw her from far, you better hide. When our days, sometimes you didn't go out to work. And if she caught you, when we, need, when we came in to Majdanek, they did not have latrines yet built, but only those holes. Regina mentioned about them. And next, really, when she caught you, she would dump you to these holes. And I would like to even mention more a little about this hanging. She was always walking with two, three sh uh, German shepherds, and she had um, a whip in her hand. Because we were counted twice a day, in the morning, like 5 o'clock, and then in the evening, you know, after we came from the fields. If she was going through the rows, and she would see you, even if you wouldn't stand up straight, or she didn't like your face, whatever, she will put up those German shepherds on you. It is really very difficult in these days, as uh, women can be so sadistic. In this camp, as you know, what I have to also mention when I witnessed those two girls. And this also gave me the initiative when I finally heard, you know, denials that I have to speak about it. When I witnessed those two girls and before they die, and the last scream of this girl, do never forget and take revenge. How can you forget this? And then the moment I have to re, you know, tell you about my mom. When I was already you know, separated to go to, to Auschwitz-Birkenau, and after the selection, this was Mengele was selecting us. He came to Majdanek. I'm sure everyone you know who Mengele was. And I'll never forget this fellow. He was short and always looking like he would come out from the bed top with a white stick, leg, you know, left and right, and he was doing this selection there. When he, when all, it was probably around September, I would say, it was sunshine, when we all naked went through, and when we came in front of him and he put me to the right and my mama to the left, and we knew already what is happening. So you can imagine, I wanted to go on my mama's side, and the SS woman slapped me and she pushed me back to the left. When in, in the ones where they supposed to go to the guest chamber, stayed on in the same field. And we were, and they took us to the ne next field, which Regina mentioned, but I want to myself talk about it. When the Blocksperre came on, you know, she explained to you, it's not only a whistle, but you know, it's like, you know, um, alarm would come off. And you always knew with this, this alarm, you know, you have to be inside. We knew always something is taking place, taking place, that we, they don't want us to see it. And something was pushing me, like, 
It's unbelievable power to go to this door, and this little door had a little peephole, very small. And just when I looked out, I saw my mom in this row walking with this lady from my hometown. I still remember her husband was a lawyer, and she was in this column. How can I even tell you what was going with me? I fell apart this evening because the next morning they sent us already to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Auschwitz-Birkenau, I don't have to explain to you, was one of the most greatest killers from all the other camps. When we came into Auschwitz-Birkenau, though those day in uh, this was in 1943. And they did not have built yet the train to go in into the, you know, into Birkenau. Because, you know, Auschwitz was a separate, I don't know, can I tell you how many miles. And since we already went through the selection, we had, did not go through a selection anymore. And they sent us straight to the um, sauna, which this means they gave you a bed. And we were all sh shaved completely. We looked like monkeys, really, you know. The beauty of the woman is the hair. And um, we were assigned to different <laughs> barracks. And later on, as you probably see in the picture, you know, pictures that they built, you know, um, from the ramp, when the people came in from the selection, to, to, you know, the ones what to, went to the Birkenau Auschwitz, they had a train, the ones where they're going to the guest chamber, I have to explain to you. It was going on the train, and if you saw my picture, one moment, please, I want to explain to you better to understand. And I don't know, you know the story about it, that I found this in the Life magazine. And you can see they put a train coming in, yeah, right there. You see it coming in the middle, and this till the crematorium. And my barrack was so close to the boat. On one side was the one crematorium and, uh, and the guest chamber on the other side. And when I saw the five, the, my um, field five, I just could not believe it. I went bizarre. That's the reason I put it, you know, under to, in it to show the people. Auschwitz Birkenau was only a camp, a camp which people died from uh, malaria and typhus and, and also starvation. In Auschwitz Birkenau, we had women, of course men too, but the women were separated, and they, you know that. We had five guest chambers. The last guest chamber was built when I was there in, in uh, Auschwitz, and they call it Brzezinka. This was the biggest, you know, uh, guest chamber, and it was surrounded with uh, like a little forest around it, you know, to, to hide it. But the crematorium and the guest chamber where I was very close was really on the open. You could see it. It was very, we had women from all over Europe from Belgium, France, um, Czechoslovakia, from all countries, European countries, we had, in, they were in uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau. It was very easy to commit suicide. And we had always, when it came, you know, around, to, you know, fall, we had every day some suicides. Whoever maybe was courageous at that time, I was not. I wanted to survive. All you had to do is put on two fingers on the electric wiring, and that was the end. But I would like to point it out to you. The most women who commit the suicides were from countries in a higher level of culture than, uh, than Poland. And not only that, the climate in Poland was very much the same like in Auschwitz-Birkenau, so we were more hardened to take this uh, type of uh, weather. And um, 
you did never know exactly when you will go through a selection. Sometimes they would surprise you. Let's say you worked outside in the field and you're coming just in, in, inside in the, in the camp. And as you know, probably from history, we had even little orchestra and playing when we were marching. And as soon you marched in, sometimes we would be all surrounded and we could see, I still remember his name, Tauber, he was just, you know, like, like Mengele, that we knew right away we are going through a selection. The selections took place usually in a building which was, you know, would you take showers there, and it had two entrances, from the back and the front. I cannot go into to tell you how I survived two of them, I escaped. On the third one, it was impossible. I wish I would have more time. You wouldn't believe it, how I survived. Uh, thanks to the Almighty who gave me the sixth sense. If I wouldn't use my sixth sense in the camp, I would not be standing here. And also later I found out what helped me to survive was I had typhus before they closed the ghetto. And then I realized after the liberation, this was my also a very big thing that for survival, that you after you get you know the typhus and with no any we didn't have any um, you know uh, now you get you know all kind of shots and things nothing we just either you survived or died, and this leaves you that you know you're immune, you cannot get it anymore. And that helped me tremendously too, not to get the typhus, because this was the greatest, one of the greatest killers too. So Auschwitz-Birkenau, you never knew what will happen next. I want to go to the third one, but I was no way